Hi, I'm Constance Marie, and you're listening to You Might Know Her From with Anne and Damien. Well, help. <laughs> no, no, no. Let's use it. Let me Wait, use it. Let me use yeah, it. I wish that you could see. I wish our listeners could see your fucking face. <laughs> First of all, you have lanolin on your lips, and they're popping like wild, and then you look like you had a stroke walking into the microphone. I was trying not to say, like, well, hello. I was trying to say, like, welcome back, and then I was like, well, I think I did that already, so then it just turned into, well, welcome back to another episode of You Might Know Her From with us, Damien and Damien Anne. Damien and Anne. I'm Damien. I'm Anne. It's good to be back with you. If you haven't been here before, this is our podcast where we shoot the shit with each other, talk about the comings and goings of our lives and pop culture, and interview an actress each episode. So welcome to the show. Damien, how are you today? What do you got for me? Oh my gosh. I have some things for you. So I I started to catch up on Gossip Girl. It returned. It continues Mm. to be deranged, but I'm invested. It's like so weird. Did you watch any of it? I watched the first two and a half episodes of the first season. I did not feel the need to continue the teachers are like in a a, like a b plot that's like they're on a sitcom and then like the students are all the same age in like a drama and it is wild to me. yeah and then i was like for minded this week that todd almond is on it playing like like a gender non-conforming gay man who i think is sort of based on jordan roth and i was like Mm, so then i was like that makes sense so then i googled broadway world message boards todd almond jordan (laughs) And people were Literally like, "All roads lead back to the Broadway World <laughs> message boards." It's true. Um, let, let's be transparent. We already recorded one whole intro that it is about a Broadway World message boards, <laughs> and we said, "This is bad. Let's do it again." And then here we are, back again, back, back, back again. Take me to those Broadway World message boards. Oh man, it just made me laugh because like the Broadway World message board people are just so vicious. Like I don't have an account, and if I did, I would probably lie and say I didn't. But I don't have an account, but I do love to read them once a year i revisit the, the message boards about tony collette and manti patankin in that production of the wild oh, party and it's like he he like spit on her and she filed a complaint and then people are always defending manti patankin which drives me bananas you already know how i feel that's why jake gyllenhaal is on my sh- shit list because i feel like he's yep. like trying to do the same thing i'm not into totally. it i'm not into being so method that you're awful absolutely unless not. you're a woman and then i'm a little more forgiving <laughs> Of course. Well, like that is so topical because what's his face? Jeremy Strong, that New Yorker profile that Michael Shulman wrote Mm. came out about Jeremy Strong and everybody was like literally Jessica Chastain tweeting on behalf of Aaron Sorkin. uh, Did you see this? Yes. Okay. It was horrifying. I couldn't believe like, first of all, it wasn't even a hit piece on Jeremy Strong being like method, though he is method. But like, I couldn't believe that people in Hathaway posted on Instagram, like coming out of the woodwork, trying to like defend his honor. I was like, he's fine. He's like on a very successful prestigious show. Nobody needs to defend him. I would defend an actress for being method absolutely like when Faye Dunaway called her assistant like us like a gay little man who could needed to go get her lunch or something that happened like a year ago right when she was in <laughs> I was just, I was just thinking about how like I'm the kind of person like there's like some gays that'll be at a Christmas party and we were just at a holiday party together and I watched this happen where like one person was like criticizing tomato like cherry tomatoes when you leave the end on us and you slice them and leave the end and then another person was like criticizing the lights and literally was changing the light bulbs shout out to our friends Daniel and James who are the two people that did this but I was like I'm not I have neither of these afflictions like these are not my things that I do but the thing that I would do is like scream at someone at a party defending Faye Dunaway being like I I don't care if she was mean. How many men have been mean? <laughs> Which is exactly like I like I will defend her despite her being awful. I will defend her. Correct. You're right. She has is, has terrible behavior on set, but it doesn't matter because like I'm sure Francis Ford Coppola is a dickhead. I'm sure that we know that Stanley Kubrick was a dickhead. Like people terrorized women on sets for years. She can throw something at her assistant. It's fine. She can change. She can change what the best picture winner is and act like it was Warren Beatty's fault for all I care. That was the great. <laughs> can I? Okay. So I'm going to share something and you're going to tell me if we needed to edit it out. But we did okay. communicate with Faye Dunaway's people for a while and they did respond back to us and the publicist was like, she's never going to do this LOL, but thanks for asking <laughs> 
I really appreciated the LOL because it was like, oh, we didn't think that we were going to be in the universe where Faye Dunaway was going to say yes, but then you were entertaining it. But then the LOL really put us in our place. And I was like, good for you. Really well played. It was like beautiful, like pitch for or like, like lovely, like love the idea of the podcast. She'll never do it. LOL. But like, that, like, like good luck. And I was like, oh, I appreciate you responding. <laughs> Shout out to that person. Hopefully they still have a job working for her. <laughs> You'd be surprised some of the responses we get. Sometimes it's literally like, how many more questions do you have? It's like, sir, we asked you one single question. <laughs> I forgot about that person. How many more questions are you going to ask me? I already said she'd do it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Also, like, I like when we have good relationships with people and then they'll pitch someone and they'll be like, do you want to interview Joe Smith, who's originating the role of Riff in the West Side Story revival on Broadway that no one wants to see? And we're like, hello, we, we only interview women and non-binary performers. And it's like, OK. And then they send us another man. Oh, bless. This is the work that we do. This is our plight. This is our plight. But you know what? It's all worth it when we end up with a lovely interview like this week's. And you know what? We did get that from a publicist. Ashley, shout out to you. Thank you. Because yes, she understood the premise of the show. And she was like, I have a great person for you. And that, of course, is this week's guest, Constance Marie. Oh, wow. Constance is like this sort of perfect mix of somebody that's in things from different eras of my Mm. life that I love in a variety of ways. But also we were talking earlier about I think she's just so smart, so kind, so engaged about the work that she does while also like taking the piss out of herself. Like she doesn't take herself that seriously, but she's also really serious about the work. It's sort of my favorite combination of an actor to have on the show. She's been in so many huge projects that are important to us. And then it was exciting that she's working on this show that drops literally tomorrow with love the amazon series that is this sort of sweet holiday story about a latin family and there's like a trans love story there's a gay love story mark and delicato who we talked about a lot with previous guest Ana ortiz is also co-starring it's really delightful and kind of the perfect thing to binge when you're home with your family mm. so it really was just a perfect storm to get to talk with the great constance marie we can't wait for you to hear it bye, bye, bye. You might know her from Selena, George Lopez, Undone, My Family, Mi Familia, American Family, Switched at Birth, Law and Order, True Crime, The Menendez Murders, and the new Amazon series, With Love. Welcome back. We are here with actress and dancer, Constance Marie. Constance, thank you so much for taking some time out today to be on You Might Know Her From. Very excited to be here. Okay, so the first thing we want to talk to you about is your new Amazon series, With Love, mm. created by One Day at a Time's Gloria Calderon Callet, which premieres actually tomorrow. Yes. <laughs> yes, it does. I'm so excited to talk about it. So each hour-long episode takes place on a different holiday throughout the year and follows a family through the ups and downs of their love lives. Gloria has been like a buzzy go-to creator. Was she what drew you to this project or like what was it that like got you involved? Well, I've been doing this for, I don't know, 33 years, 35 years. We just, we stopped counting after 30. And when I read this script, I've known Gloria and we always, you know, we're like, oh, we got to work together. We got to work together. But, you know, she's always on something and I'm always on something. And so like ships passing in the night, but She's so well respected and so creative and so strong and so about representing Latinx people in in positive lights and in creative lights and like furthering just our stories. And, you know, especially in this America, (laughs) America, you know, just kind of furthering all that along. And when I read the script for With Love, it was so exciting to see a Latinx people in a rom-com. It had never happened before. I mean, yes, you get the like one person in some movie or something, but this was like a whole family. And, you know, there was so much diverse representation. We have LGBTQIA+. We've got Afro-Latinos. We've got Latinos. We've got white people. It's awesome. Like we all mix together like the melting pot we were supposed to be. It was funny and touching and thoughtful and then funny again and the latinos in the part characters these roles were in like we made it to the upper middle class i was Mm. very it was win 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 and i thought oh my gosh if i could be a part of this project it would just be it would be magic because i in my career have been able to work on projects that i'm very proud of and i feel like represent the latinx community in a in a in a different way in a positive way and this does that 
So as you mentioned, this show features a predominantly Latinx cast, mm-hmm. as well as a transgender and gay love mm-hmm. stories, like separate, but also both, which is very cool. From our research, this seems to be your first role in a, an explicitly queer or gay project with like a queer bent. Was that like a concerted effort for you or something that just like sort of happened stance, like it just fell into your lap? Wow. I never even noticed that. But like, like Selena is gay interest, but I feel like this yeah, is like, yeah, yeah, yeah. has gay characters like being very gay and queer. Holy cow. I never even noticed that. Like, I mean, I grew up in West Hollywood. So like my whole <laughs> life is, you know, <laughs> I've been a rainbow my whole life. And in my, <laughs> in my friends and I, that I never actually realized that I... I, that can't be true. But if it is, well, then, you know, I'm so excited to be here. One of the things that, you know, and, and it's across the board is that the, the gay characters, the, the trans characters and, and the Latinx characters, they're not set up in some kind of trauma that somebody has to fix. They're not victims that need to be rescued. They're just people on their journey and Everything is looked at. I mean, we've got some great scenes, and I really wish I could tell you about them, but it's about challenging stereotypes that we're used to seeing and, mm-hmm. and dealing with these LGBTQIA plus everybody. We got AAPI characters. Like, there are not in traditional ways that you're used to seeing them. The storylines and the characters are approached with respect and with love hence the name. Gloria calderon Kellett is a genius when it comes to how she writes the characters because you've only seen the first episode and she touches the tip of the iceberg. It's like she just barely touches it in the first episode and then the second episode and third and it really builds and you're gonna, it's just wonderfully executed. So I'm very happy to be here in my very first LGBTQIA plus <laughs> project. Okay, Constance. So as we were diving into your career, one of the things we were so obsessed to find is that you got your start as a break dancer under the stage name Speedy <laughs> and appeared in music videos, Pop and Locking for Prince, Belinda Carlisle, eventually touring as a dancer in David Bowie's 1987 Glass Spider tour, also with Peter Frampton, which, by the way, that tour was choreographed by Tony Basil, the legend herself. Mm. So can you just walk us through what was that audition process like for the David Bowie tour in particular. Can I just say, how do you know my street name? Have I ever said that in an interview? You're good. We dive deep. We dive deep. Oh my gosh. Yes, I did tag that name on a wall in a dark alley. (laughs) Well, basically, I grew up in a wonderful time when if you didn't have the money for dance lessons and you couldn't study legitly, you could learn to do this break dancing, hip hop, locking, just street dancing. And you learned it at all the underground clubs and everybody had their own style. Like I was in Prince videos and Cher videos and, you know, they would basically just go down to the clubs, the choreographers, Tony Basil, and she would find the dancers that were the style that would fit the style of the video, whatever they were choreographing. And we would literally have our little tape at the audition and pop it in our boom box and just go you know, because no, there was no hip hop classes then. We were the only ones who knew how to do it. And so they would just take us. And if it fit, then they would try to <laughs> try to choreograph us together, be part of the video. And um, Tony knew of me from this underground club called the Rhythm Lounge, because, you know, the clubs used to move around every night. And um, she asked me if I wanted to audition for something. And I thought, oh, sure. Is my rent still due? Yeah, I'll audition. (laughs) And I didn't know what it was for. Part of the audition was acting because I didn't know this at the time, but David does everything on a very um, theatrical scale, David Bowie. So we did our little dance thing that I was used to, but then we had to do all these exercises where we would take a pillow and a blanket and like fall asleep on the wall. And we would, you know, she would describe you as a character and you'd have to become that character and improv as, as that character. I, I, there were so many people auditioning and I can't believe it that I got it out of all those, you know, because I did not have a degree in dance. I didn't have any of that. And I went from working at a fifties diner in a crack neighborhood in Hollywood, living in a single apartment to traveling around the world first class on a private jet with David Bowie and Peter Frampton. 
that'll change you, girl. You know, and this was pre-internet. <laughs> that means I couldn't even Google any of the European places that we went to. So it was a long shot, and I was so blessed to have it. And I, I bless David and Tony every day because they changed my life. Hmm. Is there anything you can share with us, like the most wild or like decadent thing you got to witness or partake in while you were on that adventure? Oh, God, the list is kind of long. Um, <laughs> we'll take one. We'll take one. Well, I have a surreal moment. Oh, God, there's so many. Uh, one of the most obs- just obscure ones is, well, there's another one right there, if I think about it. It's like, do you want to hear about Peter Frampton, Bono, or Princess Diana? I'm most interested in Princess Diana. Okay. Princess Diana, one of the most grounded people I've ever met. So I did a dance number. It was this new kind of dance where I would get in a pair of skis and they would turn the torque up so high that no matter what I did, I never popped out of the skis. And there used to be this great Canadian avant-garde dance troupe called La La La, Human Steps. And they did this thing that I... Tony Basil choreographed me to do, I would get in the boots and I would like a worm (gasps) go like this. And it was this weird skill set of having like really flexible calves that you could almost lay down with your feet in the feet. And David Bowie would push me like from far away. Like it was almost like he was pushing me away and we would do this kind of dance like that. And Peter Frampton would sing, uh, it was his solo song. And so anyway, I got injured because we were performing outside in Ireland and my ski slipped to the side Mm. and I didn't pop out, but it hit my shin and my calf pretty badly. But you know, you're on a world tour and you can't really sit that one out. Otherwise that song disappears from the song list. So I had this numbing spray. And when we got to London, David was all stressed out. He was like, I got five street dancers and I got to teach him how to behave with the princess. Okay. And he was such a lovely human that he wanted us to meet the princess. It wasn't just him. He he wanted her to meet everybody. And so she came back in her little hot pink leather suit. So cute. And I was holding that numbing spray that I had to spray on my knee and my my shin to keep doing the show. You know, we were supposed to call her marm and curtsy and all this stuff. And then uh, she takes the numbing spray out of my hand that I'm holding and goes, what is this? Mouth spray? And I am not going to let me be the one who numbs the princess's tongue or she sprays it in her face. So I snatch it from her hand and then I push her on the shoulder and go, silly, this is numbing spray. I flicked the princess and everybody you could just feel the pause and she starts laughing and was like oh thank you so much and she didn't even (laughs) flinch she was wonderful but of course I heard about it later like what are you doing touching the princess and I was like but she was fine with it I didn't want her to spray her tongue she thought it was Banaka I mean really it was a lose-lose situation for me right yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. right 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 that's my princess Diana story oh that's good and no secret service or anybody took me down either that was awesome well done well done do you have like permanent injuries from that? That sounds awful. Like scar tissue. <laughs> yeah. Where do I start? Yes, I have. Okay. Not from that thing only. I mean, you know, the whole spinning on your head thing tears your hair off and you don't want to do that. I mean, originally, none of us were taught how to do this to protect our bodies. I mean, I danced on cardboard in Venice Beach for change, you know, passing the hat. to. You just did what you had to do. And, you know, you're young. You're like 18. Yeah. You're, you're 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 impervious to any pain and now I'm 56. I'm like what was I doing? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, so Constance, one of your most memorable roles is of course as Selena's mother in the 1997 mm. biopic Selena co-starring Jennifer Lopez, Lupe Antaveros and Edward James Olmos. Your portrayal of Marcella and her memorable hair are downright iconic, truly. <laughs> <laughs> this was a huge, buzzy film. It was a, only a year after she passed away. Yeah. Can you talk to us about how grueling that audition process was to get that role? Oh, first of all, can I just correct you? It's not co-starring Jennifer Lopez. It's starring Jennifer Lopez. Fair so enough. I appreciate you giving me the praise, <laughs> but co-starring Constance Marie and everybody else. <laughs> and I will follow that up by saying that I actually screen tested to play Selena. 
full outfit. There was like 10 of us. And um, Jennifer got the role. And it was with a director that I had worked on with previously another movie, My Family, Mi Familia. And he invited me into his office. And I thought, oh, I'm either going to get it or not get the job. I don't know. Could go either way. And he sat me down. He said, you know, unfortunately, you didn't get the role. It's not going to go any further for you. But would you be interested in reading the role of the mother? And I thought, well, that's really weird because, you know, I'm not old enough to have like a full grown, you know, daughter like Jennifer, three years younger than I am. I didn't know she had it at the time. I didn't know who got it. I thought to myself, you know, my rent was still due. And so I had to work and I had played older in my family, Mi Familia previously. So I knew about age makeup. And I thought as an actor, no matter how old your child is, they're always your baby. You know, like you're like my daughter's an inch taller than I am and she's 12, but she is my baby. So I thought if I could just, you know, wrap my mind around that, I wasn't even a mother yet myself, then I could do it. And, you know, it was a two and a half hour age aging process with makeup and those wigs Mm -hmm. that actually Marcela Quintanilla gave us a little lock of her hair so we could match it exactly. Yeah, it was a very difficult time because it, we actually shot within that first year. It came out mm. after. So the family, was, everything was raw. The family was very, very vulnerable. And actually, Marcela Quintanilla was the last person to meet with her actor who was playing her because she just couldn't. It was too hard. And I've only ever seen the movie twice. Mm. And I, the second time was really just during COVID lockdown recently with my daughter. Because it was just too, like, knowing the family, knowing the circumstances. And when I finally did get to sit down with Marcela so I could, you know, pick her brain and learn about my character and see her and her mannerisms and everything, she would just light up and tell me these stories about Selena. And then simultaneously she would stop and realize that she was talking about her daughter who had passed on and then that she would just lose it and uh, it was it was really a hard process for her and because of that it's so funny as I even get emotional thinking about it now but um I, we all put everything into it that we could because it was we were there with the family and their loss was palpable the film is really beautiful but it was sort of shocking to sort of see you in that whole get up mm-hmm. but we also we, we get to see you sort of in like your real age and then we get to see you aged up but I right. have to say that the middle aged Marcella is one of my favorites because of the wig and the glasses <laughs> like as, on, a, on an actor level you know as you said you were dealing with Marcella and this is a real person whose life and legacy you're trying to honor while dealing with the sort of rawness of this pain. Like as an actor, were you working sort of outside in and using the sort of like the wig and the glasses to sort of get into that? Oh, or was sure. it much more internal, external? Well, the loss, because I had not ha- been a mother yet, the loss, you know, it was kind of a collective process because every, uh, every one of us as a human understands a sense of loss. And that was one of my I remember with my acting coach, Larry Moss, wonderful human, I remember thinking, because, you know, as an actor, you want the job, you try to get the job, and then when you get the job, it's like, oh, shit, I got the job. How am I going to do this? You know, I'm not a mother. I I don't understand. I'm not old enough. And you have all those doubts. But one of the great things he said was, do you know what loss is? You have loved and lost. And it doesn't matter if it's your cat or whatever it Mm. is you understand loss on a deep level and nobody knows use whatever is personal to you and so from that standpoint it started inward and then from the outward i i really just sat with marcella and watched tape after tape after tape and listened to her tejano accent and her mannerisms and everything and so marrying the two together was amazing. And I didn't even realize, because, you know, as an actor, you're not always, you know, sitting outside judging your process. You're just inside trying to do the work. There were some great, we did an interview side by side once we were towards the end of shooting with Marcela Quintanilla and I for Christina. And I'm in the Marcela gear, you know, her wardrobe. She even gave her eyebrow pencil so it could match. My, I mean, she was just so sweet and lovely. Yeah. 
but she's sitting next to me and she's wearing black cowboy boots and black jeans and a black tight t-shirt and this fabulous jewelry. And I'm like, Marcela, what, what, papa, look what's happening to you. And she goes, Mija, I saw how they were dressing you in the movie. And I said, I need to change my style. That's so cool. I was like, okay, <laughs> awesome. She was all rock and roll now, and here I am in these like, ah, you know, pastels, and I'm like, oh, lucky me. That is so cool. <laughs> One of the things I have to assume that people yell at you on the street is like washing machine, which yes. of course, which yeah. of course is like, you, you, like the best part of the movie. It's you and young Selena practicing one of the moves. So the question is, what is the demographic of the person who yells washing machine at you the most? And who do you give it to? Mm. Is it like guys being like, hey, washing machine? And you're like, no. You know, across the board, it's... I think it's pretty evenly split. Men, women, and little kids. Okay. All of them ask for it. And it's interesting is that scene, so I did not get the role of Selena, but Gregory Nava, the director, knew that I was a great dancer. So he wrote that scene so I would be able to do a little dance thing. Mm. And the little girl who played Selena Young, she had a certain skill set and she knew her dance moves. Well, basically... She just taught her dance moves to me and what she could do. And then I could reverse it as if I was teaching her. And so we had the choreographer was wonderful. She gave names to every little dance move that this little actress could do. And we would just call them out. And so, you know, and I knew her style. And so I put my own spin on it. And so it's become this phenomenon that is just mind boggling to me that, I, I mean, I'm just so proud because one of Selena's uh, real dreams that she wanted to accomplish is she wanted to sing in her native tongue, which was English. And sadly, it took till after her death that her English speaking album came out and the movie came out. And then everybody realized what a wonderful talent that she had always been. It was just that language barrier crossover that hadn't happened Mm -hmm. yet. So, I mean, I'm so blessed. I would have played Edward James almost to be in that movie. (laughs) (laughs) It really, it holds up beautifully. It's really a great tribute to her and her talent. But also, I'm so glad you mentioned Gregory Nava because I was so delighted to go back and revisit so much of his work because you've collaborated with him at least three times. Yes. And each project has sort of been a landmark in its own way. So in addition to Selena, you worked with him on the feature Mi Familia 1995 and the 2002 PBS series American Family. Mm -hmm. So he seemed to have compiled this sort of troupe of Latinx actors that included all the people that we've mentioned, like Lupe Antiveros, Isai Morales, Jennifer Lopez, Edward James Olmos, you, of course. So at some point in your relationship with him, I think he's a beautiful director, Mm -hmm. by the way. Like, at some point in your relationship, did you develop a shorthand with him and that sort of crew of actors that you worked with multiple times? Yes, very much so. It's interesting is because, like, Edward James Olmos... I've played his wife, his daughter, and in flashbacks, I played his grandmother. I mean, really, truly, the only version of Edward James Olmos I have not played is Edward James Olmos himself. (laughs) It's time. Yeah, and we did have, you know, it's interesting is because American Family was originally done for CBS, and they chose not to pick it up. But PBS and uh, Johnson & Johnson actually, you know, put the deal together to make that happen. And I remember, it was so funny, is because, you know, I'm, I'm trying to make a living and, you know, pay my rent and stuff. When it was CBS, I would, in Greg's, like, Constance, I wrote this role for you based on, you know, all the wonderful things that you bring to a character like Tony Sanchez in My Family, Mi Familia. So we're going to do a TV version of it. And I said, okay, but, you know, I, I need to have a deal to make sure that I can pay my rent. And she so was like, no, no, it's written for you. So don't worry about it. And I was like, Okay, so my representatives are talking to CBS and they're like, the quote was from the representatives at CBS were like, I am at the top of a very short list. And I go back to him and I'm like, Greg, uh, you know, I have to start going out. It's pilot season. I have to make a living. I have to. And he's like, what do you mean list? You are the list. It's written for you. And I was like, well, you need to tell them. Right. That's what's happening. And. Because of him, I ended up getting a holding deal, which they very rarely gave to women back then. It was mostly men who had it because apparently Mm -hmm. there was tons of talented, so many talented women, you could just plug them in. But, you know, you get your like 
heterosexual white yuppie male and we got to lock that guy down. Right. You know, so I don't know. But but because of Gregory Nava, I got one of my very first holding deals. That's very cool. I love that. So while you're working on the sprawling like family drama that is American Family, Mm -hmm. you're also simultaneously working on George Lopez's ABC sitcom. Yes. Can you talk about what it was like to juggle those two roles? One that had like gravitas and then the one that was a very traditional three camera family sitcom. Like, was that a difficult thing to go back and forth between? I think I have to start with it. It was an incredible blessing. I mean, I'm thinking how, why I'm, I'm so lucky. I mean, I've got like the first dramatic all Latino cast show. And then I've got the first sitcom in with the Latin family in English, uh, ah, ah, like an embarrassment of riches. And I'm going to bust my ass as much as I can to make both of these happen because I believed in both of them wholeheartedly. But you were working hard. I mean, I heard you said that you worked like seven day weeks yeah. for the first season, I think, of George Lopez, right? You were yes. working both like seven day weeks. Yeah. So we would shoot three weeks of George Lopez. No, that was the second year. I was originally on American Family and they were so generous because in order to even get George Lopez, they had to shoot me out every single day, like finish my day so I could make it to my auditions. And of course, on George Lopez, I had to audition seven times to get the mm, job. We're gonna, yeah, I can't. And I mean, at that point, I was like, I dare you to not give me this role. I mean, you've seen me <laughs> so many damn times. If you see anybody else in this role, well, then fine, give it to them. But it was hard. One of the interesting things was, first of all, I'm really blessed to be able to do comedy and drama. That's why I love With Love, because it has both of them together. Mm-hmm. It's a dramedy. And all the actors are so adept at, at, at going in between the genres. So for American Family, we were dealing with some serious, like George Bush was president, and uh, some we were at war, and the storylines were very heavy. So when I would rap and then go to George Lopez, my comedy was way more serious. And I remember one of my notes from the director was like, okay, it's still a comedy, Constance. You are mad at George, but you're not that mad. And I was like, oh, right, 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 right. Okay, I got to switch gears. And then when I would go from the three weeks on George Lopez to American Family during the George Lopez break, they would be laughing because I would bring all this humor to the role. And then between takes, I was like totally messing around. And it was like the best of both worlds, but it would, it would bleed from one project <laughs> to the next until I kind of figured it out. You mentioned that sort of both shows were historic in their own way. Is that something that you were able to sort of recognize in the moment or only with hindsight? You can sort of see how groundbreaking both shows were. No, I, I knew exactly how groundbreaking they were. I mean, I've been doing this so long from the days when, you know, Latinx people, actors could not even audition for Latinx roles because Marissa Tomei was playing a Cuban and they slapped some bronze around Catherine Zeta-Jones and she's a Mexican in Zorro. You know, Anthony Hopkins, a little more bronzer and he's like the old Zorro. It's, mm. And was it, was it, I remember... The Perez family came out. Oh, yeah. And House of Spirits. Is that the one with and Glenn Close and Meryl Streep? House of Street? Spirits and Jeremy yeah. Irons. And oh, my God, they're yes. All, all Latin. They're supposed to be Latin. And they didn't even have the decency to put the bronzer on them. They were just like, oh, they're Latin. So mm. I knew. And, and basically, my employability, my, my income depended on whether or not they were going to have the courage to actually hire a Latinx actor for a Latinx role. And slowly but surely, they learned it was not okay to do that anymore. Like, you couldn't do that with a AAPI actor or Native American actor or Black actor, but Latin, little bronzer, and, you know, George Hamilton is a Mexican on Everybody right. Loves Raymond. So I knew how important it was. I knew how much harder we had to work to just even break even you know, with no budgets and and stereotypes, try to break them down. It was, it, it's been a very, very long journey. So I do know, I did know at the time, but like with Selena and like with George Lopez and, you know, my family, me family, I did not realize that they would have such lasting impact. Like people have approached me and said that, you know, in their Chicano study class, they watch My Family, Mi Familia Mm. in college. And I'm like, really? And the same thing with George Lopez, you know, we made it to the mainstream. I mean, George Lopez is a show 
since I traced my roots in America back to 1850, is a show I wish I had when I was growing up. Instead, I had to watch yeah. The Brady Bunch. It wasn't that bad, you know, but I would have liked to have a George Lopez at the time. Yeah. Okay, so, so speaking of George Lopez... You played Angie, the matriarch mm-hmm. of the Lopez family, for six seasons on that series. You just mentioned that you had seven auditions to get the role of Angie, and that the network, I think, originally like passed on you twice. Twice, <laughs> cool. So, like, what was the thing that, like, how did you shoehorn your way back in to say, like, I'm gonna get this? Like, how? What? What, what did it take to convince them? I didn't. They kept coming back to me. I don't know who they had or who they thought they had to do mm-hmm. the job, but. One thing I learned was that, you know, with everything against us in the industry when I started, I had to be better. I had to always be more prepared than everybody else. And so I just showed up with to every single audition that way. And this one, I did the exact same thing. And I would get a certain, I would go, you know, one, two, three, four auditions and then no, thank you. And okay, fine, fine, fine. But I knew I did the work. I knew I brought my A game, you know, and that's all I can do. In this business, you'll go crazy if you think that you can do more than your best. That's all you can do. And you have to check yourself and make sure that you're doing that because the odds being Latinx will be against me. And I knew that. So then they would call me again. And where I could have gotten caught up in my ego, I was like, sure, I'll come back in and I'll do the work. And you give me a different scene and I'll do, cause that's what I am. I'm an actor. I do the work, whether I get the job or I don't get the job. And I know that that is part of the process of my job. 80% rejection. The rest is gravy. So when they call me back in again, you know, you get the laugh, you do well. And then they tell you, you go in three more times. Oh, it's not going to go any further. Thank you so much. <laughs> but I know I've done all my work. And of course I have American family to go back to. So it's not such a, such a loss. And then they call me again. And a lot of my friends were like, how dare they keep doing this to you? And I thought, well, it's an opportunity and I want to do it. So let me just check my ego at the door. And then I would go back again and they would say, would you test? Sure, I'll test. I dare uh, so you to, is. <laughs> to not give me this damn job. So I sign my contract, we make the deal and then I test and no, thank you. It's not going to go any further with you. Okay. I go back to my other job. They call me again and say, would you screen test? And I think at this point, I really dare you. You know you want me. Why are you not booking me? So fine, sure, I'll go to a screen test. I'll show up, hair, makeup, wardrobe, and we shot it on the Drew Carey stage. That was part of my process was I say I have to do my best and do my work. And if the opportunity keeps coming, I'm going to show up. And eventually I will wear you down. You will realize you Mm, want me in this job. You were a series regular on the family soap switched at birth for five Mm. seasons. And the Mm -hmm. show follows, for our listeners, the show follows two teen girls who are literally mixed up at the hospital. One child is hearing, the other child is hard of hearing. The show won a Peabody and is noted for being the first mainstream television series to have multiple deaf and hard of hearing series regulars, as well as scenes shot entirely in American Sign Language. So you actually learned ASL for your role. What I was thinking about this, I was like, you know, did having to learn ASL intimidate you or because you're a dancer, like, did you trust that your dance background would sort of like help you because you already are used to communicating with your body? First of all, I was wonderfully ignorant as to how much work it was going to be. Plus the director and the producers reassured me that, you know, they would cut away from me so I wouldn't have to do so much sign language because I was originally the first person cast because I needed the three weeks to learn sign Mm. language to look like I had done it for 12 years. And so that's what we originally went into or I, the mindset that I went into, but also I know what it's like to represent an underserved community in the entertainment industry. And I thought I cannot fake it. The deaf community is going to be depending on me to give an accurate portrayal. I can't cheat it. So with my dance background and my Latinx talking with my hands all the time, 
it was a perfect storm. And I remember my coach, because they hired a coach to teach me. He said, uh, what ethnicity are you? And he has a cochlear implant and he's deaf. His name is Anthony Natale. He's actually on Nancy Drew right now. He's mm. a great actor. I said, oh, I'm Latin. He goes, oh, you'll have no problem. Don't worry about it. You'll have no problem. And because he's, <laughs> he's Italian. And so we worked on it and I knew that, you know, this was so, so important. So just like I would do any dance from my dance background, it's muscle memory. And what I was asked to do was SIMCOM, which is called simultaneous communication. So you're signing in ASL, but you're also acting out the scene in English. And it's not exactly the same. So you're doing both at the same time. So if I'm signing slow and I don't have the muscle memory and I don't have it down, then my speech pattern will be slow. The scene will be slow. And so I had to rehearse, 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 because there's that one great scene in the pilot where I tell my daughter to have people love her, love her for who she is instead of who they think she should be. And I thought that was the whole deaf community, all children, everybody, that, that was a universal theme that needed to be done. It needed to be acted well and it needed to be signed well. So once I got that down, <laughs> I set a pretty high bar for myself. And so then they wrote more and more and more scenes for me. And I learned sign language at 45 when arthritis is trying, starting to kick in. And I rehearsed 24 seven and I shot 12 hour days and they just kept adding more scenes. And I, I had a two and a half year old daughter. And I remember her saying, cause my hands were in pain all the time because mm. I, I really wanted to do a good job. My remember my, my, my daughter was because I didn't realize I had told her you can't hold this hand for mama. You have to hold this hand. And I, it makes me cry. She said she grabbed my hand. She goes, Mama, is this your boo boo hand? Can I hold the other hand? And I thought, OK, this is this is a lot. And I'm in pain a lot and I'm icing my hands a lot. But the dancer in me was like, well, this is just what you do. And then it got to the point where um, they had these beautiful scenes with Katie LeClaire and with Marley Matlin, you know, no, no pressure. My best friend on the show is Marley Matlin, only the number right. one deaf actress in America. <laughs> like they really counted on me and I felt like I was letting them down. But, you know, I had my daughter and and I had to think, you know, for myself. And then I think it was the second leg of season one. I realized when they wrote a scene where I was transcribing and translating a court case to mm -hmm. my, my daughter, Katie LeClaire, on the show. And I went, I am not an interpreter. This is not even a scene between us. This is just using me as an interpreter. I can't physically do this anymore. And I, I went and I went to a doctor and they told me I had permanent nerve damage and tendonitis in both arms and carpal mm -hmm. tunnel in my left. And, mm -hmm. and I was like, I, I have to be done. And the, the, the deaf community and the deaf actors were so disappointed because the sad statistic is that 80% of adult parents do not learn sign language. And I knew of deaf fans who were using me as an example of, look, if this actress can learn sign language for this show, then please learn sign language for me because right. you're my mom oh. or my dad. And so it's so hard. And also I'm, I can imagine like drawing those boundaries for yourself as an artist is also difficult oh, when you're in a place of business where you're like, I actually, this is detrimental, but also the weight of the show is also really important. So that's, it's difficult. Yeah. I, I held on as long as I possibly could, but you know, once you have it, like if I text too much or if I blow dry my hair too much, it, it flares up. But what they, yeah. what they ended up doing was writing it into the story. Mm. What happened to Regina Vasquez, my character, is what actually happened to me in real life. Because we kind of had to say goodbye to it for all the fans and everyone. Right, right. Well, it's interesting because we were watching another one of your credits, which really took me by surprise, and that's the beautifully strange and this ambitious Amazon series, Undone, mm. which uses rotoscope animation, the same animation technique used in Scanner Darkly, mm -hmm. and it's just used to breathtaking effect on this show. If I'm being completely honest, I hadn't seen it, so I was excited to delve in. It's like this show that explores time, memory, mental health, loss, in a really smart, funny, dark way, and it has a diverse cast of like Latin actors, deaf actors, the main character has a cochlear implant. Mm -hmm. 
I was just really floored and impressed by this show. What has it been like watching yourself actually be animated? Mm. And is season two actually happening in 2022? I can't recommend the show highly enough. First of all, I'm so glad. Thank you for watching it. It is. We did shoot season two during COVID, so it, it was a lot longer of a process. And as yeah. it is, we shoot live action scenes, and then they turn us into graphic novels. I mean, none of us knew what this show was going to be. It was just oh, a Latinx family representation, and oh my gosh, <laughs> we're in Texas, and it's in English, yeah. and I just get so excited every time we, we have an opportunity. And because it was animation, we didn't know what it was going to be. And so it was great because for myself, I did resist playing characters with accents or who are stereotypically like Mm. immigrants because there were just so many of those roles. I was like, we need to be reflected as part of the melting pot already. And so I got to work on Law and Order, the Menendez murders, where I played an actual Cuban woman. And then so I got to work on my accent work. And then in Undone, I was like, ooh, I'm like an old school Latina mom from Mexico, and I get to bring out the accents again. And I love the actresses and, and actors. What what really struck me about the series was it was about making choices. And because she gets to make different choices. It's like Groundhog Day. And every time mm-hmm. she makes a different choice, there's a different outcome. And she gets to play it out. And if it's not exactly the outcome she wants, she gets to go back in time and redo it. Be it mental health or magical realism, we're not 100% sure. So, well, sign me up. That's that's wonderful. Between that and the Latinx component, I was ready to go. And in the beginning, they literally photographed us from every angle, like 3D. And then we shot live action scenes with no sets in a conference room, the same wardrobe. And... We would shoot these weird transitions that I didn't really know what they were going to be. And they would have to show us on the computer what our world looked like. So we could, we just had tape all over the ground. And oh, it was crazy. fascinating. And then ultimately, when we saw that all the backdrops were impressionistic paintings by Hisco Helsing and how we looked as graphic novels, it was it's stunning. It's beautiful. And then, mm-hmm. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. And please, I appreciate your honesty. After a while, you kind of forget that you're looking at graphic novels because... Completely. Yeah. It, it also didn't... You know, I was sort of like, what is this going to be? I read about it before I watched the first episode, and I was like, oh, okay. It was very different than what I was expecting. Mm-hmm. And then it does. It sort of... You don't think that you're watching animation. It feels hyper real in mm-hmm. some respect. But the the color, the tone, the texture of all of it, I think actually adds to the emotional heart of the piece in some way. Yes. It doesn't feel like you're adding something on that is unnecessary or extraneous. It's really... I think it works beautifully with the material. Oh, I, I, I'm so glad that you feel that way because... I- I forget that I'm watching it, that it's an, like mm-hmm. we're graphic novels. I forget. And I don't know if that's just because I'm so close to the material. But but I do love that there are transitions and things that you can do that you wouldn't be able to do in right. real life because the budget would be just like a Leonardo DiCaprio movie where, you know, the ground is rolling and we don't have that budget. <laughs> um, I, I really recommend the show. I have to say, like... Some sort of like time bending is not usually my genre. Mm. Again, just being honest, this show took me completely by surprise. Loved it. Really, really highly recommend Undone. Thank you. I think it's because the emotional core is so real. Yeah. That you kind of forget you're in that genre. Yes, completely. Loved it. Thank you for watching. Okay, Constance Marie, we are just about done with you. We're just going to enter the rapid fire part of the show. This is just everything else we didn't get to. We're going to throw at you. You can just... Giddy up and we're going to be done. This is where I fall on my face right now. This is when it, the wheels come off the bus. We're putting you in those skis, those Tony Basil skis. <laughs> okay, I'm used to it. Yeah. In some places on the internet, both you and David Bowie are credited in the 1987 movie Back to the Beach with Frankie Avalon and Annette Funicello. We watched the entire movie trying to find you and couldn't. Can you confirm or deny that you were in that film? Yes, I was in the Pee Wee Herman. Bird, 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 bird (gasps) is the word. In an Afro wig with tie-dye makeup and hip huggers. Got it. Didn't recognize you. Is David Bowie actually in the film? I, I didn't see him. Couldn't find him. He's credited in some versions. Okay, great. Thank you. Are you also an extra in Breaking 2, Electric Boogaloo? Yes. Big crowd scene. Dancing in cowboy boots. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Held my okay, feet. we're going to find you. We're, we're going to find you. 
Okay, Michael J. Fox let you wear heels when you played his love interest on an episode of Spin City. Name an Damn actor. You guys are good. I'm sorry. I just gotta say. Name an actor who wouldn't let you wear heels on set. I don't know because I didn't get the job because I was too tall. <laughs> okay, you do a voice role in the animated film Puss in Boots. Were you pissed though that you had to play a human in a movie about cats? No, I was just happy to be there. I kept thinking I was going to get fired. But I didn't. <laughs> you did great. You did great. Thank you. You played a cop and a bartender on the soap opera Santa Barbara. What was the <laughs> wildest plot line you had to justify on that show? And was it hard to sell? Well, I was hung upside down on a bikini in a desert island. And I cannot remember anything else about the storyline. So I think it was pretty <laughs> fantastic that I can't even remember it. Oh, and I did not find that. I hung upside down so long that I broke blood vessels and capillaries <gasps> in my face and my eyes. Who knew that could happen to you? Oh, my God. Okay, the union needs to get involved. <laughs> union. Okay. You punked George Lopez and sat in the van with Ashton Kutcher while the whole thing played out. Was that experience fun or was there a point where you were nervous that the whole thing might backfire a la Frankie Muniz getting pissed or Hillary Duff having a panic attack? It was hilarious and I was so happy to be a part of it, but I wanted them to go further, but they were smart enough to not. Because I wanted George to lose his... I wanted him to lose it, but they were smart and like, no, 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 Con I was suggesting things and they said, Constance, we cannot do that. <laughs> you wanted a big reaction. Oh, yes, I did. <laughs> okay, as you mentioned, you played paternal aunt to the Menendez brothers in an NBC anthology, Law & Order True Crime. Despite your 30 plus years in the industry, this was your first foray into the Law & Order universe. We have a couple questions. One, how were their craft services? Two, did they give you a wig? And three, be honest, of the two brothers, Lyle or Eric, which one was hotter? In real life or the actors? IRL. Lyle. I agree. That's what we said. Yeah, 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 I agree. That's what we said. Craft service was awesome because we had to sit and do those court scenes and listen to all that horrific stuff that was so depressing. And so you would just kind of eat to survive. And in the beginning, they did not give me a wig. They just teased my long hair up super high and sprayed it with, I don't know, Aquanet from 1987 to make it stay. And at the end, I was like, guys, is there anything you can do? So then they gave me a half wig. Okay, okay. I love a head. fall. I love a fall. Thank you. I don't even know what the hell it's called. A fall. Okay. Raquel Welch played your mom in the 2001 dramedy Tortilla Soup and fainted when Hector Elizondo asked you to marry him instead of her. Jenny Gago played your mom in Mi Familia and she fainted when your character, who is a nun, told her that you had married a man who was a priest. Be honest, which actress most convincingly played unconscious? Oh, that's a tough one. I'm going to go with Raquel because she fainted at the table read and literally landed on the ground. She fainted at the table read? She literally <laughs> fell off the chair. And we were all so nervous, like, is this real? Is she? Is she? <laughs> uh, she sold Jenny. it. <laughs> Nothing against Jenny. Love the woman, but she did not faint at the table read. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. Love it. Okay, so you replaced the lead actress in the must-see TV sitcom Union Square which suffered from what some call the single guy curse, which essentially meant no show could succeed in this Thursday night time slot between Friends and Seinfeld. So my question is, how generous was NBC in the lead up to your show's premiere? And how quickly did it turn when the show kind of didn't live up to expectations? It was brutal from the very beginning because mm -hmm. it was developed for another actress, the show, and she didn't test very well. So they secretly cast me without me knowing that it was for the lead. And then when I got it, my booking the job was announced simultaneously as her being replaced. So mm. it was always like the much troubled show from the very beginning. Uh. And then that spot is hell because if you do well, they do blame it because your other shows, the responsibility for the positive is given to the other shows. And if it's at all negative, then it's because it's all you. I mean, yeah, that's really a great point. I never thought it's about unattainable. That. You can't, you know, Seinfeld wasn't even Seinfeld when it came out, but yep. it was, a, it was a cursed spot because the expectations were way too much. I think I answered the question. Absolutely. You did. Okay. Okay. Constance, last question. Your full name is Constance Marie Lopez, but you've said that the other Lopez's have hogged it up. So you just decided to go by Constance Marie. Yes. So you've worked with Mario, Jennifer, and George Lopez. If you were not an actor, Constance, and you had to be trapped in an elevator for four hours with any of those other Lopez's, who would it be and why? 
<sighs> Meaning you're not you, they don't know you, and you're trapped in an elevator with them. I'm going to pick George because it'll be funny. It'll be torture, but it will be funny. Mario's <laughs> cool, but I don't think he's that funny. And Jennifer would not be happy, and I don't want to know what's going on with her in that elevator. She will get us out. But but with George, the time will tick by. He'll be pissed, but it'll be funny. Beautiful justification. Thanks. That's a so great much. answer. Constance Marie, thank you so much for joining us today on the show. This has been such fun. Yay, thank you. You guys are wonderful. Thank you so much. Holy shit. Stop what you're doing, go to the show notes, click on motherfucking Constance Marie in those skis with David Bowie. It is physically outrageous. I kind of was trying to imagine it in my head as she was talking about it. And I was like, let me just fill it in. Let me just fill it in afterwards. And I clicked on it. I said, this is outrageous. I can't believe anybody's body could physically do this. Like my, I think my shins would snap forward. I I watched it right before we started recording and I was stunned. I, you just need to watch it. It is wild. Constance was so cool. She was like, you lose hair when you, when you spin on the cardboard. (laughs) I just like love, I loved her so much. Please watch her show. I'm very excited to watch it with my mom over the holiday. We are going to binge it. Constance did tell us that if you can't watch it right away, you can add it to your watch list and that helps them count as like a, I don't know, like a Nielsen rating, I guess, in in Amazon Prime world. So do that so that the show is a success because I was very charmed by the first episode and I'm look, very much looking forward to finishing it. And also like her journey with ASL was like oh my God, heartbreaking, but also very cool that one, very cool that she took it. And because of course, my first thought was like, that is so scary. And she was like, I guess I was just naive. But then literally not being able to do it then anymore. It's like it's, it's beyond. Right. And having to sort of stand up for yourself in your workplace is always kind of difficult. And all of this. And also she was in Selena, which is just like so cool and such like a, <sighs> a, a seminal film. Right. Yes. Well, I'm not going to say seminal because it's related to semen, but I will say that it's very important. I also was very tickled by the fact that, you know, we try to walk a fine line on this show of taste. And sometimes it's difficult because when we watched the Menendez brothers <laughs> law and order, we were like, look, here's what we want to talk about because you and I talk about the Menendez brothers, like two to three times a year regularly for the 11 years that we've been in close contact. She had an answer right away. She said in real life or the actors. And I think she had an answer for both. And we should have asked about the <laughs> actors as well. <laughs> she was like right away, Lyle. And we're like, absolutely. She was so game. I loved her. And I, I it was such a pleasure to go back and watch her work because she's done so much good work. Folks, we hope you enjoyed this interview with Constance Marie. And if you did, we hope that you'll share it, like it, share it with your friends, make sure you're subscribed and locked into You Might Know Her from wherever you listen to your podcast. And while you're there, please leave us a written review. It is the best thing that you can do to help us keep doing the thing that we are doing. If you leave a review and you send us a proof of it, I will send you a copy of Leah Remini's book. It is excellent. We need reviews. Hmm. So do us a favor and we will scratch your back with a copy of Leah Remini's book, The Taking Down Scientology. I love her so much. So if you know the show, you know that this is the time where we would usually connect this week's guest to next week's guest. But as you know, we're going into the holiday season and into the new year. We're going to be dropping an episode next week on a different day than usual. And then we're going to take off until the new year. So you will see us next week. And then you will see us back here in the same place the first week of January with an actress episode. But we thought it would be good to prime you for what we will be talking about next week. And of course, one of those things is going to be... And just like that, which we hope you've already been watching. And if you haven't, please, dear God, catch up because there's much to discuss. Folks, please find us on social media. You want to see that video of Constance Marie and her ski boots? You want to see, I don't know, us talking about how they're fucking reviving six feet under? Find us on social media. You can find me at Damian Bellino on all of the things. And that's Damian with an A. And you can find my co-host here at Rodeman. That's R-O-D-E-M-A-N-N-E. You Might Know Her From is produced by us. That's me, Ann Rodeman, and my best friend over here, Damian Bellino. We want to thank our tremendous consultants at Grumpy Entertainment. That's Jason Jude Hill and Daniel Sears. They're a pair of oh, just delightful husbands that do incredible work for us. We are so appreciative of all of the stunning work they do on our behalf, so thank you to them. And if you are a fan of the editing on this show, which why wouldn't you be, it is courtesy of the great Daniel Sears. 
We also want to thank Gang. Gang is three-fourth women, Gang is from Philly, and Gang provides all of the music underscoring each and every episode of You Might Know Her From. You can download and stream Gang wherever you listen to your music. You want to find that thread about Broadway world people talking about Mandy Batankin spitting in Tony Collette's face? <laughs> you want to see that video of Constance again dancing? You know what you're going to do? You're going to go to the show notes, right, Anne? And that's where Anne compiles all of these special little treats for you. They live underneath the episode description, and they're there just for you. Oof. But the question really does remain, do you think that Jordan Roth is flattered, or do you think he's insulted? <laughs> I honestly didn't make that connection, and I don't know how I didn't, but I want to say that I think he's flattered because he works, like, in media and theater, so I feel like there's, like, no bad publicity, but, like, did they ask him? Uh, we'll got to post it on Broadway World and say. I have to say that the teachers in that show are played by somebody that I went to college with, so <laughs> it's like they are geriatric at 38. I love it so much. <laughs> 